Welcome to Rebel Speak and Thinking Through Scripture. And today we are um, talking about Sarah. We're talking about Sarah. In Scripture, we're going to look at her. I think it's going to be one of two. I think next week I will think about Sarah or speaking of Sarah. That's what I thought of speaking of Sarah. I want to, I want to speak about Sarah today. I, I really love Sarah. And I've, I've spent some time with Sarah in Scripture, and I've thought about her a good bit. I find her a very compelling woman, a compelling person. And one of the things that I think is very easy is to read women in Scripture very one-dimensionally, like a little gingerbread man on a piece of paper. And these women, in spite of the fact that the culture hides them, they are worth spending time listening to and looking, thinking about. <laughs> so today I want to, when we meet Sarah, her name's not Sarah, her name is Sarai, and her name will change to Sarah, which will mean princess. But her name is Sarai, and she is married, we're told, to a man named Abram. And Abram's father is Terah. I believe that sometimes, I am a little dyslexic, so sometimes I can do weird things with names. But the father is Terah, and um, God calls Terah first, which I think is interesting. The father is called, and they only go part way. Okay, they they don't. Um, it's law, um, Lot, and it doesn't matter. But there's Abram and Sarai, with their their father, and then they start moving towards the land of Cana. But they're they're down in the land of Ur. So if you think of the that's how I do it, the two rivers, Euphrates and Tigris, down here, they, and they move up, they don't move far, they go far and they, um, they stay with family, <laughs> they stay with family, and um, I don't know, I, I just think about that, like how sometimes family can hold us, sometimes our, our orientation and our relationship with family can hold us back, but then God, after after his father dies, God calls Abram and Sarai, and they take Lot with them, and they move towards the land of Cana. And, and they're leaving civilization. They're leaving, they're going to a lawless land. Okay, they're going to a land where there's, there's no great powers, you know, there's no armies, there's, there's no, there's all these little kingdoms, right? There's all these little points of power, but no comprehensive point of power. So there's a lawlessness to the land. And so you, 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 you are as fit as safe as you are mighty. You're as safe as you are mighty. And they get to Shechem. They go to a place. That's the first time we see Abram worship the Lord and build an altar in northern Israel. God says, I'm going to give this land to your offspring. So there's a promise. And an altar is built. And when we meet Sarah, I'm sorry, one of the things I want to say is that we're told that she is she is not able now sarah it says now sarah was not able to have children so we we know that childlessness is a defining reality for this couple so when god says that i'm going to give you um give this land to your offspring that wow right this is the stuff of abram that's counted as righteousness because there's something in Abram and this beautiful, these dialogues with God in Genesis, they're just beautiful, beautiful dialogues. And Abram builds an altar. God says, you're gonna, I'm going to give this land to your offspring. And then it says he travels south near Bethel and he builds another altar there and worships. So there's this part of Abram that's responding to God in these, these chapters of Genesis. And then he says he travels south in stages and then they go to Egypt, okay. And in scripture, I think we have three of these stories where husbands are going to call their uh, wives sisters, or they're gonna deny that they're married to them to protect themselves. And I, and I think scripture is really saying this is bad. Okay, however, it's gonna happen here with Sarah, and she's still Sarai, Sarah and Abram in Egypt, and it will happen again with them. And it will happen with Isaac and Rebecca, I think once, but. I could be wrong about that. But at least three times we have this situation where there's this denial. And, and I think scripture is saying there's something very wrong when the masculine protects itself at the expense of the feminine. 
they also want to th say that perhaps there's something in the masculine that does that more easily than it ought. Perhaps a real weakness in the masculine towards the feminine is being addressed in these chapters where there's a presuming upon her in a way to self-protect that you shouldn't be presuming that way upon your wife. Marriage should look different. You're needing to take your self-protection and your desire for self-protection in your marriage is problematic. I believe scripture is saying that. And what happens is, again, because Sarah is so beautiful, okay, she's so beautiful that Abram asks her to, to tell the king, the whatever the leader in the land of Egypt, that he is her sister. And she does, and she's taken in to the, to the harem. And Abram is given great wealth. He's given human wealth because there's it's an age of slaves. He's given gold. He's given silver. He's given all these things, but it's not okay with God. And, and something I want to say very clearly here is that Abram deeply underestimates Sarah's role in the promise that he had near Shechem. When God said, I'm going to give this land to your offspring. There's something in Abram's um, behavior that is not expecting anything from Sarah's womb, or he would treat her differently. He would treat her differently. So that's just to me um, like something I want to point out. There's something that Abraham is, Abram is not treasuring this woman who's the means to that which he yearns for. He doesn't know how to value her, and he doesn't know how to cherish her and it's evident in this behavior. But I also want to say that Sarai makes Abram rich. And the next interaction we have, it mentions, it's going to be um, a relationship um, between Abram and his nephew Lot. And they're trying, we're, we're back into the land of Cana. We've gone into Egypt, and now we're back in the land of Cana. And there's tension between the herd, herdsmen of Lot. They're both wealthy, Lot and Abram. But a good bit of his wealth has come from Sarai and her relationship that God saved her from. Okay, so her husband puts her in this very vulnerable relationship with Pharaoh, an incredible power that Abram's afraid of. He doesn't trust God for his wife. I, I, I'm going to say more because I, I wanted to say more about this. He doesn't trust God for his wife. He only trusts God kind of for himself. He's out for himself. That's a weakness in the masculine, I believe wrong orientation towards his wife, but God in her vulnerability, I just wanted to say this, in Sarai's vulnerability, in all that Sarai does and doesn't understand, knows and doesn't know about God, God protects her. He protects a soon to be called princess woman. God protects her. And uh, they're blessed. The couple's blessed through that relationship. Okay. Um, so they go and, uh, let's see, Lot, they're going to split the land, and Lot chooses the, the, the best of the land. And the scripture reads kind of where we see Abraham, Abram, I want to get that right, Abram, a little down. And God comes and uh, God says, you're going to have a permanent possession of this land. So there's different things that God's promising offspring and then land. And God says, I love this, explore this new possession I'm giving you. So there's this, it's very evident that Lot's getting, you look down, they're up high and they look down and here's the fertile, 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 beautiful, abundant land and, and Lot picks that. And then God says to Abram, explore the new possession I'm giving you. I just love that verse, okay. <laughs> and then Abram moves to Hebron and builds an altar and um, he, uh, there's a lot that happens. He, he ties to a priest named Melchizedek, and um, God tells him, I will protect you, and I will, oh, no. Okay, I'm going to keep going. God says, do not be afraid. I will protect you. And I'm going to pick up in chapter 15, okay? So one of the things that also happened is there's this king of Sodom that uh, Abram has an interaction with, and he wants to give Abram some of his wealth and Abram says no I don't want anyone to ever be able to say that they made me rich 
it's, it's just such a beautiful righteous stance like nope I'm going to be in a situation where it's going to be so evident that God got me where I'm going and it's interesting because this is part of that winsome bit of Abram that I know God's drawn to like no I want to see God work but at the same time there's something about Abram trusting God for Sarai his wife that Abram can't do doesn't do and I'm going to I'm going to read right now from this 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 interesting we're going to see Abram sad and then we're going to see a response and I want to cover this okay afterwards the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him do not be afraid for I will protect you and your reward will be great okay so they are vulnerable very vulnerable in the land of Canaan. We want to we want to read these chapters in Genesis this way of the absolute vulnerability, like the Wild West. I'm from the states. We have the the Wild West where there's kind of who's in charge, who's in control, and God says, "I will protect you, and your reward will be great." Okay, so there's this statement from God: "Your re reward will be great. You're going to flourish." God's promised offspring, and He's promised um, possessions. Okay, great possessions. And here's what Abram responds. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? What, oh, it's so beautiful, right? What is the point of your rewarding me when I don't have a son? Like, there is no one to inherit this great wealth. What's the point of it? Since I don't have a son, Eleazar of Damascus, a servant in my household. I want, to, I want you to hear this because there's something scripture's going to do here on this servanthood. Eleazar of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. My wealth's going to go to a servant. You have given me no children, so one of my servants will have to be my heir. Okay. There's no joy for Abram that a servant will have to be his heir. I just want you to hear that. No joy that a servant will have to be his heir. Then Yahweh said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir. I want you to hear what God says to Abram. Because I feel that Abram should say this to Sarai. And he doesn't. He doesn't. Sarai will learn through experience. She will learn through the event of birth. But what God speaks to Abram, Abram is not able to speak to Sarai. And I think it would save them a lot of problems. Okay. So one of my servants will have to be my heir. Then Yahweh said to him, no, your servant will not be your heir. Wow. For you will have a son of your own. This is so powerful to me because Abram doesn't speak this to his wife. You will have a son of your own to inherit everything I am giving you. Whoa. Then the Lord brought Abram outside beneath the night sky and told him, look up into the heavens and count the stars if you can. Your descendants will be like that, too many to count. And Abram, listen to this, these are familiar words for those of us that know scripture. And Abram believed Yahweh and the Lord declared him righteous because of his faith. Then the Lord told him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land. I brought you here for this purpose. I brought you here for this end. And then he asks, how can I be sure? And he has this encounter of God lighting. He, he builds up, builds an altar, and God himself lights it. And it's just a beautiful, 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 tender interaction between Abram and Yahweh. Okay, so that happens. Now I'm going to go to chapter 16. But Sarai, Abram's wife, had no children. Okay. We have these two chapters back to back. Abram says to God, what good is all that you're promising me? And now we have Sarai saying, what good is all that you're promising me? And Abram doesn't understand. He's not able to speak what God just spoke to him, to his wife. But Sarai, Abram's wife, had no children. So Sarai took her servant. What did, what did uh, Abram say? Eliezer, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. Sarah's going to give all her wealth to a servant. So Sarai took her servant, an Egyptian woman named Hagar. And I, I wonder if, I kind of think that she came when one of the gifts from Pharaoh, right? One of the, well, she's paying this price for having to deceive or 
I don't know, deceived, but stuck in this vulnerability when her husband cannot trust God for, for her safety, <laughs> for his own safety in light of her, let's put it that way. A, a servant, Hagar, and gave her to Abram so she could bear his children. And she said this, the Lord has kept me from having any children. I just read that and I think, Abram, where was your mouth? Why couldn't you say, no, the Lord's promised us, Sarah. The Lord's promised us. Why couldn't he speak into her sorrow some of what God was speaking into his sorrow? Why couldn't he do that? The Lord has kept me from having any children, Sarai said to Abram. She told Abram, the Lord has kept me. So here, Abram, God just met him in his fears of his inheritance going to his servant. And now his wife, he's in a perfectly poised position to say to Sarai, no, God has promised us. But see, the us is so weak. There, there, there's so much that God is redeeming through time in history. And one of them is this incredible weakness of the us in marriage. The Lord has kept me from having children, Sarah said to Abram. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. Perhaps somehow through my servant. I, I think it's so powerful. And Abram agreed. <laughs> this is a very telling. Scripture tells us things. He's just heard, there's, there's no understanding. I'm, I'm pretty certain at that time they thought the woman housed, the, the, the life was in the, the man, in his sperm, and it, it shot into her and then she was just like a little vessel, a little housing vessel, kind of not a part of the equation, just housing and growing like a little, I don't know, incubator solely. And, um, and, and, and there's something that God's teaching them through this story because they don't have right orientation, right? Everything's fallen. We call it the fall in uh, Genesis, I don't know, was that two or three, right? The fall when they eat of the apricot or apple. They don't have a right orientation to what marriage is meant to be, this amazing reflection, right? It's a, it's, it's a holy, it's a, it's, it's a sacrament. Marriage is meant to reveal beauty, eternal beauty, not happening here. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. And this happened 10 years after Abram first arrived in the land of Canaan. They want us to know this has been, they've been living under this promise for 10 years. Okay, they've been living under this promise for 10 years. So Abram slept with Hagar and she became pregnant. When Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress Sarai with contempt. Sometimes we turn to false things, trying to, <laughs> you know, trying to get to the ends that we deeply, deep, most deeply yearn for. And those things turn around and mock us. They mock us, mock us, mock us. We, we, we can't wait. But I also want to say that Sarah hasn't heard the promises Abram's heard. She's, she's out there kind of fending for herself, desperate desperate and we don't see God speaking at this point we don't see God speaking to Sarah but he's spoken to Abram and Abram can't speak what she needs to hear it would be a different story if she then went ahead and willfully determined in this fashion we don't know that story we don't know what she would do but we know this that when the servant girl okay the servant woman and I love Hagar I I will talk about her soon, okay? There's a lot about her that's very cool because God is so faithful. For she is just as vulnerable, except that she has no honor. Her mistress, Sarai, who, you know, why would you mock someone who's in a position that Sarah's in her, Sarai is in, in her life? Not, not wisdom, not wisdom. She began to treat her mistress with contempt. And then Sarai said to Abram, it's all your fault. Now this servant of mine is pregnant and she despises me. Wow. The, the arrogance and the contempt. Though I myself gave her the privilege, I treated her well. I blessed her. I put her in a privileged situation, circumstance. Even though I did that, <laughs> this is how she treats me. Wow. This is how she treats me in my vulnerability. 
in my lack, in my sorrow, in my suffering, this is how she treats me. She despises me. The Lord will make you pay for doing this to me. I, I like, I'm just, I'm much more familiar with this verse saying, let the Lord judge between you and me. I don't, I, that, that change, I'm not attempted. It says, Hebrew says, let the Lord judge between you and me. I see people laugh and kind of mock Sarah at this kind of schizophrenic move. Not at all. She, she's saying, I think this is very powerful because Abram's done something so wrong and, and she knows that she's not meant to be in this situation. And I wonder a little bit how Abram's behaving that's allowing, like, is, is something, of, is he treating Hagar better than Sarai right now? Is he complicit? I just wonder that, because it feels that to me, when she says, let the Lord judge between you and me. This circumstance I can't abide. My heart was broken, and I moved in the only way that it, it wasn't unheard of, right? It was kind of commonplace. Will you have a child for me? I can't have one. That happens in its own way today. And then the, the woman is in a position and she mocks and demeans. And Sarai says, let the Lord judge between you and me. Abram replied, since she is your servant, you may deal with her as you see fit. So Sarai treated her harshly and Hagar ran away. I'm going to end there today. I'm going to end my little speaking of Sarah part one. She runs away. <laughs> And I don't know, I just want to talk more about Sarai's broken heart. <laughs> That's really what I want to talk about. That we've got Sarai, she's not a princess yet. She's in a situation where her husband's hearing a lot of great promises and doesn't seem to be speaking them to her and she doesn't know her own value or worth. She doesn't know. Everything about the culture says her value demeans. As Hagar demeans her, so does every other narrative in the culture. There's a devaluing. What's the one place she gets value? Her beauty. When Pharaoh sees her and gives great gifts to her husband that make them wealthier, more rich. But she doesn't understand God's value of her. That the promise, there's no such thing as a promise to Abraham. Abram. <laughs> there's no such thing. No Sarai, no Abram. No Sarai, no Isaac. No Sarai, no promise. No, Sarai. And there's a way that I see in these encounters, through these encounters, thinking through Scripture, that things get corrected. That when we read Scripture well, broken understandings of marriage, <laughs> broken understanding of human worth as it is male and female, are meant to be corrected. Our eyes are meant to be, you know, opened. <laughs> That every promise God makes to Abram is made to Sarai. Sarai is not, what's that word? Um, extraneous. <laughs> she's, she's not out, she's not just kind of a, okay, you're here, whatever. No, she's essential. She's essential. The promise is essential to her. The promise is essentially about her. She's essential. And that's what I, I hope to convey <laughs> as you think through scripture with me today. The essentiality, the preciousness of Sarai, the, the, the brokenness, the cultural brokenness, and the God that heals in the midst of broken culture unto redemption. God bless you.